Welcome to Camelsville Baptist Church. I'm Brad Lauer, the discipleship pastor. It's my honor and privilege to be with you today as we study God's Word, as we continue this new study we began last time in Elijah. Today is the second of 12, and I hope that you will stay with us through this whole time or go back and watch some previous times as you check us out on um, our website at uh, camelsvillebaptistchurch.com or you go to our YouTube channel and look up um, Bible studies. You can look up me or Elijah or our church and they'll be there and you can find them. Um, or if you would like a copy, just call us at the church office. But, um, you know, last time we were together, we were talking about how Elijah took a, a courageous stand against idolatry by confronting the king. Dangerous thing to do to confront a king. Dangerous thing to do for any of us to confront somebody of ultimate authority and power. And, uh, but he did. Now we're going to look at some of the consequences of that today. Uh, what happens when you confront and you bring truth in and, and, and people don't like it. And so we're going to look at that. And I know I oversimplified the whole matter, but it's okay. So let's pray and we'll, we'll, we'll get started. God, we just thank you so much for today and the opportunity we have to study your word, to um, study who you are, to study your character how you worked and moved through different people through different time periods and, and how you use people to be your instrument. And God, we pray that for ourselves, to be your instrument in today's culture, today's world. So God, teach us today, challenge us today, correct us today, encourage us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last time we talked about idolatry and how hard that is and the, the idols in our own lives. And that it does take a courageous stand even for ourselves to identify an idol in our life and then be willing to change it, to move it farther back in the list. Remember, there are going to be things that draw our attention and things that deserve our attention and our focus, but they can't supersede God. And what happens is I, I believe we, we put them on a, on a line and we just kind of pick and choose at the time and God becomes one of many options instead of the first option, the first filter we should use in any decision we make. But anyway, so this week we're going to look at when we are in danger, it is natural to turn to God and ask for Him, to ask Him for protection. He wants us to trust the many promises in His Word. Um, and some of those promises, I'm just going to read a couple verses that I think um, that have helped me. Let's just put it that way. Uh, Psalm 46 1 is one of my favorite is my favorite verse God is our refuge and strength and a very present help in times of struggle Psalm 62 my strong rock my refuge is in God you may have a, a favorite verse that you hold on to when times are tough or you're stressed or you're under pressure that helps relieve that because we know that we can turn and depend on God at any moment. Actually, it should be all the time. And not that we forget about God sometimes in those, in those moments, but at the same time, do you have a verse that just pops in your head to give you encouragement or to calm your fear or to uh, release some of that anxiety? Those are two of mine. Later in Psalm 46 and 46 10, it says, Be still and know that I am God. It's hard to be still in my life. I don't sit well. I don't be still well. Ask my wife. Ask my kids. Ask anybody who knows me. I can't be still and just relax. And so that, that verse pops into my head on a regular basis. And what I do when that verse pops in is I pause. I take a deep breath and I let it out slowly. And things become clearer a lot of times. And that's God saying, take a breath. Focus on me for a moment. Don't forget about me in this process. So be still and know that I'm God. In other words, calm yourself. Take your focus on the chaos around your life. And focus on me because you know what? I got this. That's what God says to me. We know others have received God's protection in life. We're going to talk about Elijah and he hid. We're going to talk about that. We know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were protected in the fiery furnace, and Daniel in the lion's den, and Paul got a second trial in Rome. 
God protected each person differently. He can do the same for you and for me. And 1 Kings 17, 1 through 6, after Elijah had confronted the king and the queen, that's where we pick up. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, we said this last week, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be no dew nor rain for the next few years. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah again. And he said to Elijah, Leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So Elijah did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. Guess what? The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. One thing about Elijah that you find out um, that he had this amazing ability to suddenly appear and to suddenly disappear, which became very, very unnerving to anybody in leadership. All of a sudden, this guy shows up, says some things, confronts truth, confronts you with behavior, and then all of a sudden you can't find him. And then all of a sudden he appears over here and nobody can keep up with him. The Wadi Cherith is a ravine that carries runoff water only during the rainy season. Um, and that part of the world around the Jordan River and in, even into the Dead Sea of farther south, there are these, the, these mountains, these cliffs that there's, they're cutouts basically in between the ravines. And then when the huge rainstorms come, water hits the tops of those mountains, goes down one, into one of those ravines, and then the water runs downhill all the way to the Jordan or to the Dead Sea, depending on what part of the country you're in. And that's what happens. It's rugged. Uh, there are many, many places to hide. Um, I've been to the uh, En Gedi, where David went and hid from Saul. And um, you can just see it laid out there in front of you. But wherever these ravines are, there's also vegetation. That's why the birds would come. There's, all, there's water because it's running down, and it's clean water. It's just runoff. Much like I spent some time in Colorado not too long ago, and um, all the brooks and streams from the melted snow are just full of water. It's clear. It's cold. I didn't drink it because you just don't know what animal had been in it, basically is my point. But it's clean and clear, and that's what Elijah drank. And to make matters worse, the raven is not considered a very clean bird. It's actually considered an unclean bird. But they're very bold scavengers. We s now think about this. What happened in the wilderness? How did God provide for those 40 years in the wilderness for, for Moses and the Israelites? Birds came to provide meat. Basically, the, they were the meat. They there was manna. Provided. So God provided not just for the Israelites in their exodus, but now for Elijah in a very similar way where birds, unclean birds, however, brought him food, brought him meat and bread, and he had water from the earth. It's interesting. Um, a lot of times we doubt the ability to God. We'd read these stories in the Old Testament and think, well, God, that's really a good story, but is it true? Like in Daniel 3, 16 through 18, God is able. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to King Nebuchadnezzar, We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. He will deliver us from your majesty's hand, being bold and confident. But even if he does not, we want you to know, Your Majesty, that we will not serve your gods. We are not going to stand for that or worship the image of gold you set up. You see, even in 605 B.C., the Babylonians supported some children of the noble families from Judah and kept them captive. Remember that? They trained these boys in the ways of the Babylonians. These were hand-picked 
cream of the crop, gifted and talented young men that they brought over. Daniel was a part of Remember, um, Daniel was a part of that as well because the four of them got thrown in to wherever they got thrown into. Talked about food and all that. They trained the boys up in the way of the Babylonians. And Nebuchadnezzar, he was brilliant. He's a brilliant military strategist. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the face of death, confronted truth and stayed faithful to God. So God is able to save us. God is able to protect us. God was able to take care of Elijah. We look in Philippians 1, 20 and 21. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by my death. For to me, to live is Christ and die is gain. In 2 Timothy 4, 6, 16 through 18, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. In my first offense, no one came to support me, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To, be, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You have to understand Paul. Paul's writing these words. He had a single goal in life. That was it. Once the conversion happened on the Damascus Road, he had one single focus and purpose to bring praise to Christ no matter what happened to him. Part of that was his desire and his, his motivation to get to Rome because he wanted to take to the, the gospel farther than it had ever been taken and taken it to the focus of the world at that time. The Roman government ruled everything. He wanted to go stand in the Roman court in front of Caesar and present the gospel. So his goal in life was always, from that conversion point, to bring praise to Christ no matter what happened to him. Everything for Paul revolved around Christ, what he did, what he said, how he lived his life, the decisions he made were all revolved around Jesus Christ. And he believed that death was not so much of an escape from hardship, as in an entrance into joy. And that joy is to be with Christ. Being poured out symbolizes an offering in the Old Testament that was poured out, being used up for God. You know, they would pour their grain offering on the altar. It means giving it all, giving it up, being used. I pour out my life for the name of Christ. I pour out my life into my work. I pour... I pour all my energies into, that's what we say, isn't it? We're, we're, we're giving ourselves up. We're using all that we feel like we have to give to something. Why not give it to serve Christ? Paul was a Roman citizen, so he could not be fed to the lions, as was Nero's practice. You see, part of his heritage and his birthright was a Roman citizen. Nero was evil <laughs> and cruel and liked to offer Christians to the lions for sport. So when he said, the Lord will rescue me from every... Where did it go? Um, he talked about the lion. I, I can't even find. But anyway, um, he talked about protecting from the lion. He did because he was born a Roman citizen. And the Roman citizens cannot be punished or executed that way. Christians could, but not Roman citizens. So Paul had a lot of ways to get to where he wanted to get. And so as we looked at what Elijah did, he had to have faith. He had to have trust to go and live off the land for for how, he didn't know how long. And he had to have faith and trust that God was going to bring him something each and every day to eat. And it had to be enough. 
Is what God provides for you each and every day enough? Is what God brings you each and every day enough? Is it? I can't answer that for anyone. Let's look at a couple things we, we might have learned. God does not normally speak to us today as He did in biblical days. It seems like throughout the Bible, people had an audible conversation with God all the time. Or at least the ones that we read about it's like god was sitting here talking to me through a tv screen or, or through a computer or a tablet or or god was sitting next to me while i'm driving down the road or and that's those conversations that they seem to have it doesn't seem to happen that way today god speaks to us differently you know he spoke directly to elijah's prophet because elijah was his mouthpiece Today we have the Holy Spirit that infiltrates our minds and our souls and, say, and guides us and directs us. And, and part of uh, Psalm 46.10 to me, 46.10 says to me, be still because you are so busy and so restless that you can't hear my still, small voice. All you hear is the clatter and chatter around you and you're trying to think of too many options, so take a deep breath, clear your mind, and be still and be quiet so that the Holy Spirit can speak to you, Brad, in an in a intimate way. So have you heard the Holy Spirit's voice? Have you been able to speak with God? And if, if not, if so, great. Those are special times. If not, why? Are you too busy? Do you not take time to listen? Do you not take time to calm your spirit to hear God's voice? I believe I did have a, an audible conversation with God. It was in the summer of 1990 on the side of a mountain in North Carolina. I was working at Ridgecrest that summer, and I heard God say to me, get up and take a hike. And I'm like, dang gum, it's like 11 o'clock midnight or something. I just got into bed. So I got up. And I walked up to the, the side of the mountain for a little bit. And I found a little clearing. I sat down. Well, I didn't sit down, really. I tried. And then God started speaking to me. Um, I've shared my past before, but basically God said to me, because I was aggravated and arguing with God about why this, why that, I can't figure this out. And he said, would you just hush? <laughs> he said, I have forgiven you, Brad, for your past. It's wiped clean, but you must forgive yourself. And those words resonated deep that night. Not so I spent the next three or four hours um, having those conversations with God about how to forgive myself. Because that conversation before that moment was a little active <laughs> um, because I was yelling at God and I was trying to kick God and trying to, you know, I was just mad and angry. And, but that audible voice that I heard changed everything. And when I came down from that mountain the next week, then God said, now you're going into ministry. And I was like, yeah, what? You know, whatever. So anyway, but all those things happened because God spoke to me. But I also was still and quiet. But God had to do something a little differently to wake me up. How does God communicate with you? How does God spend, use His voice, His Holy Spirit, His whisper to speak to you? Is it a word that someone else says to you? You're like, huh. Something you read, the way Scripture comes alive for you that day, something that the, uh, a Bible study says or a pastor says or a song that's played on the radio. At times I've listened to um, K-Love and a Christian radio network and they... You, know, you hear people all the time, well, that song spoke to me. Or does that song speak to you? To me, it was that time on the mountainside and some still small time, quiet times that I have. The second principle that I think we can take from today, God has made promises in His Word that are always true, no matter what happens or where we live. Let me read that again. God has made promises in His Word that are always true, 
Has God ever lied? Has God ever gone against himself? No, God is true. No matter what happens or wherever we live, God directly protected Elijah by hiding him in the wadi cherith and through the ravens. He put him in a place in the world or that country at that time. The king could not find him. He was too remote. He was too isolated. People could hide out in there for decades and never be found. The only struggle they would have are the conditions. Can I get food? Can I get water? Can I be protected from the elements? So he hid him in a place, but he provided for those things that he would struggle with, food and water. And it wasn't just a scrap here there. He got a meal at breakfast and a meal at dinner. That's a pretty good deal. We have to understand also that God promises to be with us at all times. However, God never promised to always deliver us out from our problems, our difficulties, or even death. If you look at the life of Job, he told Satan you can't touch him. Or you, can't you can touch him physically, but you can't destroy him. God protects us. May not keep us from things. May not keep suffering and, and things around us from happening. But at the same time, God protects us and brings us through things. And sometimes we don't realize that till we're on the other side. We don't realize in the midst of it that God is protecting and guiding and working and, and has protected us beyond what we could ever imagine from things that could have happened. Many Christians have faced persecution throughout the centuries who've demonstrated in dramatic ways that this is true. So let me ask you a few questions before we conclude this. How does God use His Word to reveal His will to you? I told you a little bit about my story. And there are times I read a passage of Scripture for the 15th time and it says something different to me because God is speaking to me differently at that moment in my life. How does God use His Word to reveal His will to you? I'm going to be... Just tell you the way it is. If, if you're not in God's Word, there's no way He can reveal His will for you. You have to be in His Word to learn of who He is and what He wants for us and how He wants us to be. And the way these passages can remind us, remember the three, the, well, there's two I read and one I, I added. God is our refuge and strength, very present help in times of trouble. Or God is my rock, my refuge. He is in, my, my strong rock, my refuge is in God. Or be still and know that I am God. Those things pop up in my brain because I've read them and memorized them. That's why scripture memory is important. Because if we memorize scripture, then it will come back to us when we need it. It will be a resource. It will be a source of encouragement. It will be something that we need at the exact time. Think about this. How does God use circumstances and other people to reveal His will to us? If you had somebody just say something at a time and you go, what? That's God speaking to you sometimes. Or the circumstances you're in, and there's a hand there that you hadn't expected or, or something happens and there's, your will is being revealed. When we sense some inner prompting to do something, how can we test whether the prompting may be from God's Spirit or just our own desire? Good question. Because a lot of the men, especially, and I believe a couple years ago when uh, Rusty Ellison was an interim pastor, a transitional pastor, he said this, he's a professional justificationer. In other words, he can justify anything he wants to purchase or buy or get, and his wife knows it. Men are like that. We can, we can rationalize and justify about anything we want to. So how can we tell when God is telling us something or it's something we just want? You have to go back to Scripture. You have to give it some time. It's not an overnight, immediate express, expression. My son is a professional, um, what, it, what I call him, he gets obsessed with things, and so he just works himself up into a frenzy 
and overdoes it. I think he gets a little bit of that from me. But we just we get a hold of something, and we think it's the right thing, but it may not be. With him, we just give him a leash, and if, it, if it's supposed to be, it happens over time. Uh, we get that. And some of that happens with us as well. So let's think about this. Men and women in our culture learn to project independence. We don't have... We don't need anybody else. We, 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 we don't need somebody else to help us with shelter or protection from trouble. We'll take care of it. And then even on the men's side, we believe we can fix everything. If we hit it hard enough, if we maneuver it the right way, or if we just work hard enough, we can fix anything. However, the truth is we experience all kinds of stresses and troubles in life and we need God's help. We cannot do it all on our own. That's why God has put us in community, live in community, whether it's in a family or in a community of believers or or people around us who can help us. We may not need a cave to hide in, but we all need to read Psalm 23 occasionally and sing, Mighty Fortress is Our God. In Psalm 23 says this, because we may need to read it. We may need to hear it. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm reading out of the NIV version. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths and for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the, the valley, through the darkest valley, I will feel no evil. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Why do you share your problems? Who do you share your problems and your trials with? And how do they help you? What challenges would you like to ask God to give you protection from even now? And what kind of protection would you like from God as you face these challenges? God, we thank you for today. We thank you that you help us, that you protect us, and you provide us a way out. We thank you that you are a God that loves us unconditionally and no matter what. Um, and God we know that um, we sometimes ignore you we don't be still or we don't stop and pause we we run at a fanatic pace we have chaos and clutter in our lives that we don't put aside for you and so even when we know that the only place to go is you for help, we, we, we don't do that because we're, we feel embarrassed or we have too much pride. We're not able to humble ourselves in God. So I hope that we're able to take these words and these experiences from Elijah and use them to help us grow in our faith. And it will help us be more like you and to be bold and to share your love and grace and mercy with everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us. And I hope this study has brought something out that some of these words were able to uh, challenge you or encourage you or equip you in a way. Uh, Know that we're here for you at Campbellsville Baptist Church. Um, No matter how you get this um, transmission, whether it's through um, television or through the internet, our website, you can go to it, campbellsvillebaptistchurch.com, or you can go to uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel, and find these Bible studies. But you can also find more at those sites. Um, We will be live worship every Sunday morning at 1030 um, on Facebook and on YouTube or our website. You can either way. So we hope that you will join us. If you ever need anything, please feel free to call us at Camelsville Baptist Church. We're 
The phone number is 270-465-8115. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to, to know what God is doing or what or anything that you might have a question about. We want to connect with you. Have a great day.